as the Greater Vancouver Association of the Deaf president, I spent three terms leading our community. The first term was back in 1998. And then I took a hiatus while my children grew up and I was a dad and then I came back as a president and I was in the right place at the right time. I was so honored to be involved in the Accessible BC Act. Imran, if you can come to the front please to do the land acknowledgement. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you all tonight. Oh, sorry, I'm standing in the wrong spot, and how am I going to see my paper? All right, good evening, everyone. I want to give a land acknowledgement this evening. Uh, there are six different nations in this area. The Semiamu, which is signed like this. The Keitsi, signed like this. The Quitquitlam people. The Kwantlen people. The Kakite Nation. and the Sawatan people. So each nation is um, deserving of our thanks and just want to acknowledge that without them, this land would not have been where it is. And so it has not been ceded over to anyone else. And so the, those of us who are living, working and playing here are doing so as visitors on the land of those six nations. So thank you so much. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that. A year ago, June of 2021, give a shout out to the people in the room here who did a lot of work, but a year ago, the ABCA came into being. So there was the Accessible Canada Act, the ACA, and so now it's really the first anniversary in person. We should have cake. There's cake. Cake? I think you're jumping the gun, Vinu. Just hold your horses. After the presentation, there will be a celebratory cake, and we will all happily partake. All right, I'll, I'll wait. I would like to invite Minister Nicholas Simons to come to the front. Before I start, let me just acknowledge an important person, a former colleague, Stephanie Cadieu, first Chief Accessibility Officer, who's here with us. Oh, sorry. How's that? There we go. I see Sam Turcott here also, who is a colleague of mine in Victoria, the director of the Accessibility Directorate. So thank you for being here. And I have a very long speech I wrote. I might ignore it. I would rather just say how how pleased I am to be 
able to talk about a piece of legislation that we passed here in British Columbia that is designed to reduce barriers for people who face barriers in our communities so that our province can be the most inclusive and where everyone belongs and reaches their potential. And I thank the Greater Vancouver Association for the Deaf for being an instrumental part of the creation of that legislation. I have to check my notes. <laughs> so I didn't know there was cake here, so <laughs> that's not why I'm here. <laughs> but it makes it even more special. V Vinu knows that I like cake. So before we passed this legislation, British Columbia was one of the last provinces to have an accessibility act. And a lot of work was done leading up to our ability to pass this legislation. But one of the main reasons we were able to passed this legislation was because of the involvement of community members who could guide us uh, to this point. Many of you in the room tonight, people with lived experiences of barriers, had a direct role in creating this legislation. Yes. Early in the process, we made a commitment, the province made a commitment that the legislation would be written with the involvement, the direct involvement of the broadest diverse community so that the principle was nothing about us without us. And so the accessibility directorate and Sam Turcott's team were instrumental in ensuring that we heard from everybody and that we could create legislation that in fact would meet our needs. And the legislation is designed to identify, prevent, and remove barriers in our communities, wherever we are in our communities. I think over the last year, the things that we've accomplished demonstrate our desire to continue with this process because it doesn't happen fast, but we needed a plan. We needed to be able to know if we were doing well or not and measure our successes. And so just recently in April, uh, actually, in s effective September 1st of this year, over 750 public service, public sector organizations will have one year to establish an accessibility plan for their organization. They're going to have to have an accessibility committee, and they will have to have a feedback mechanism so that people have an ability to shape what their organization will do to identify, remove, and prevent barriers from occurring. And by having an actual plan with specific goals and outcomes, I think guarantees or makes it more likely that we'll be able to actually succeed in doing what the legislation requires of us. We gave them six months notice to start the work and are providing $3 million through the Disability Alliance to help those organizations meet those goals. And on May 31st, the province officially released BC's new 
accessibility plan called Accessible BC. Finally, the ministry staff are hard at work developing that accessibility tool, that mechanism that I mentioned. We were very excited to announce just back in May that Accessibility BC plan. And it was the first time in a long time that we were able to actually gather in person uh, and to celebrate the people who were involved in helping us create that plan, including Vinu. It was an opportunity for us to celebrate, although we didn't have cake, the milestones in building a better future for British Columbia. It's warm in here. I'm not really as nervous as I look, but <laughs> it's re this suit is very warm. It's part of the uniform of the politician. So, our Accessible BC plan outlines how ministries across government will be working over the next three years to embed accessibility inclusion and inclusion into the work that they all do. The plan has to be updated every year and it sets out government's priorities in advancing accessibility while continuing to collaborate with individuals as we move forward in our work. I should just say, it's, it, I'm really pleased that one of my first opportunities to speak to you is to, uh, to talk about the access accessibility plan. My mother and my grandmother were both teachers of the deaf in Nova Scotia in the early 1900s and then my mother more recently. She was a teacher for 40 years in Montreal. And so I, I feel like this is just an opportunity to share good news with friends. And I hope, I hope that everyone here recognizes that we do have a lot of work to do and it doesn't go as fast as I would like it to go, but we're on the way. Thank you. I don't want to remind people of Richard Nixon. Okay. <laughs> We're also excited to start work on the first two st accessibility standards that we announced in May. And these standards, these standards are employment, in employment, and in service delivery. The Provincial Accessibility Committee, of which Vinu is part, and Forrest, where's Forrest? Forrest was also very much involved. What, we tr what we're doing by creating these standards is to ensure that in those two sectors, in employment and in service delivery, that people understand what barriers exist for employment and what barriers exist in the delivery of services to people. So the goal is to identify those and ensure that we remove them. We make it more likely for people with all abilities to seek employment, to get employment, and to receive the services that they deserve in the province. There's Forrest. As we all know, the disability community is diverse. It, and some are visible impairments, some are not, which is why it's important that government continues to listen and speak to and consult with members of the community from all sectors so we can make sure that we, we get it right. And I want to thank the Provincial Accessibility Committee for their work. We know that, we know that it's their work that will underscore the success of what we do. 
I'm going to conclude now, which you'll be happy about. Our goal is to make sure that BC is an inclusive province where barriers that exist now will be reduced and eliminated. That is the goal. And I cannot overemphasize the role that organizations such as the GVAD have played in leading the way. I want to thank you and everyone in this room for the work that you do every day to help each other and other communities that will benefit from this legislation. So, I'll need some water after this. <laughs> While passing the Accessible BC Act into law was a big achievement that we can all be proud of, it's the beginning of the work that we're going to do together. I'm excited, I'm excited that to be part of it. I was elected 17 years ago, but I've only been a minister for one and a half years. And I know that we're all impatient, but good work is being done, and it will continue with your support. So thank you very, very much. Before you leave the stage, Robin, if you can join us on the stage. <laughs> Hello, Minister. The cake is coming. Don't worry. <laughs> Sorry, just having uh, you move over before you speak. Where do you want me to be? I don't need the microphone, though. <laughs> I'm going to use it. <laughs> it's a little warm up here. Um, I authored this book. It is the uh, for the Provincial School for the Deaf here in British Columbia. I can't believe that this book is now a completed project, <laughs> and I suppose it will actually be retired now, so we'll see. But uh, five years ago, the community selected me to become the author of this tome, really. I didn't actually go to the School for the Deaf in British Columbia. There were no photographs. Everything was in people's personal collections. There was nothing <laughs> in one place. And so I was tasked with a monumental job. And I thought to myself, it was going to take maybe five years. And I was correct. It took two years just to do the gathering from across the province, really, there was so much out there. Uh, so many photographs uh, that had no names, no identifiers, there was no history, so we'd have to speak to each person, and then COVID hit. <laughs> and there was no more traveling across the province, and there was no more schools being opened, and it became much more difficult. And those three years uh, made it so that I couldn't actually go to the School for the Deaf, couldn't go and visit different people in their homes, but my work kept going, and we were finally able to publish. And <laughs> it was actually ready to go to the printers, and they had run out of paper. I couldn't <laughs> believe that British Columbia <laughs> had run out of paper. <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> it's the wrong province. And oh my goodness, the wonderful team that worked with me for the past five years. And we were able to find a printers in Winnipeg and uh, print this book. So thank God Winnipeg had the trees. <laughs> we were able to send it off to Winnipeg and get everything printed. And we finally received the copies. Oh, when was it? At the end of March, we finally received the first printed copies. I ordered 
250 for the first run, thinking we are a pretty small group, and that 250, as of today, we are sold out. So it was incredible, the response that we got from this book. Uh, there's so many people asking for more, um, but it is my absolute privilege and honor to present this to you, Minister Simons. And uh, hopefully you'll uh, take it around, show it to all your colleagues, make sure that they get a good read in, and enjoy. Thank you. Of course. I hope that I get a copy that we can put in the Legislative Library of British Columbia to have forever. So thank you very much. Perfect. Reki, GBAD president. If we can get you to come to the stage. Just making sure we're good. Everybody's good, all the interpreter teams are ready. Okay, Reki, go ahead. Hi, everybody. I'm hoping you're doing awesome. Gotta be over here on the X. Good evening, everyone. As Fora said, I am Ricky Pele, the co-president of the Greater Vancouver Association of the Deaf, or GVAD. I cannot believe it has been a year uh, that I've been the president, but also a year of the Accessible BC Act. What a lot to celebrate. Uh, the idea of decolonization, um, but sorry, I'm in the wrong spot and people are all over the place. So, so just for myself as a person of color, as a woman leading an organization of, across the province, it is so amazing to me. And it just takes so long for that to actually show up. So to have the visual representation um, on the board of GVAD now is amazing. And I'm so pleased to be here to celebrate the Accessible British Columbia Act with everyone tonight. Accessibility means that you're not overlooked anymore, that you are recognized, that you are seen, that the accommodations um, that are required are provided because that hasn't been happening. I'll share one of my experiences. Uh, I grew up in Zimbabwe in Africa. I went to a public school, really struggled with instruction because it was all oral. Then when I moved to, to British Columbia, I was in grade three, I was nine years old and I started to learn sign language. And for me, I had a resource teacher and an ASL interpreter, and they were the ones teaching me language, giving me access to communication. And for me, that's my story of accessibility. GVAD was founded in 1929 and at that point, it was just the Vancouver Association of the Deaf. I'm sorry, I'm trying to look at my notes. And the primary reason that the association was uh, developed in the first place was to advocate for the rights of the deaf community to drive. So many individuals in the deaf community had so many firsts here in the deaf community, the first uh, province in Canada to drive, the first to have medical interpreting services provided. 
And now we have both medical interpreting services and community interpreting services integrated in many provinces. But here in BC, they're still segregated instead of integrated together into one whole. The first tests for video relay service in Canada were held here in British Columbia. So British Columbia is fairly forward looking. I remember my first call for a food order through video relay service. It was delicious, by the way. <laughs> so if you may be wondering what does GVAD do now, the advocacy isn't over. We still have a few projects on the go that we can't do without the community's help and support. The community has been asking about a hub, a deaf community hub where people can come and gather maybe every couple of weeks, maybe every month, but just somewhere that we can call our own. And just to create a deaf space, somewhere that is ASL friendly, signing centric. In a deaf space, um, there is a, well, sorry, there, there is a serious need for deaf space here in British Columbia. Deaf and hard of hearing people, regardless of how old they are, whether they are coming close to retirement or not, um, want to have a place to belong. For many of our seniors, as they get closer to retirement, they don't want to be put into a retirement home where they are the only deaf person where there's no one signing back at them, where they have no access to communication, that is very isolating and impacts their mental health. Many of our deaf and hard of hearing seniors are in those situations right now, where they're in care homes, where there are people who care about them, but there is no communication. And that really impacts our deaf and hard of hearing seniors' mental health in a negative way. And that leads to dementia in a variety of ways. And so one of the big goals with GVAD right now is to have a deaf-friendly seniors home for our deaf and hard of hearing seniors across the province where they can have not just a home that is comfortable for them, but the home that they deserve with communication where they can enjoy their sunset years. To have a deaf seniors home is going to take a lot of work. We thought about, do we need to start a building where the first couple of floors can be offices, where GVAD could have an office, where the BC Deaf Sports Federation could be housed, all sorts of different services, and then the next couple of floors could be seniors housing. Mm -hmm. That would be amazing. There would be communication, there would be access, yeah. the mental health of our seniors would be okay. And so GVAD cannot do this on their own. Honestly, the project belongs to the community. And so for those of us who are here and those of us who are not, just looking together to each other and to advocating with the Accessible British Columbia Act for the future to ensure that our deaf seniors have the access that they need. Hopefully this just um, gives you some food for thought and you can start thinking about how you can advocate as well. On behalf of the GVAD board, my absolute gratitude for all of you for tonight's celebration, for making uh, this a successful evening and for finding incredibly creative ways for us to have access in the future due to the Accessible BC Act. Thank you. making sure everyone is sorted and it looks like we're good. Do I need to pull the table closer? All right, I think I've got things sorted out. Next, I'll ask our 
other co-president of GBAD, Imran Hakamali. Can you please take the stage? I have to remember to stand on the X up here on the stage. Can the interpreters, can you all see me okay before I proceed? If I'm here, everybody can see me. Okay, just checking in with the crowd. Good evening, everyone. My name is Imran. He signed my name this way. I am the co-president, and I'm very excited to be working with Recky. And I um, hadn't seen her speech ahead of time. I wanted to leave it a surprise, and I have to say it was very inspiring. Thank you so much for your words. I'm a proud deaf person, and I'm also a person of color. And for us both to be POC and to be president of GBAD is very exciting. So there's some a few firsts um, to have the queer community represented and also to have the um, communities of color represented in the presidency of GBAD. These are some firsts that are that follow our presidency. Before I start, I wanted to recognize and acknowledge and talk about the word acknowledge. What does acknowledge mean? It's not just well done, good job, but I think about all the work of Vinu, Forrest, everyone else who put their best efforts into the planning tonight. I mean, the food's been incredible, has it not? But not only that, we've had so many restrictions during COVID, and so to now be able to get together in person um, here in the Lower Mainland is such a treat. Vinu and Forrest and their planning for this event, I, I imagined it's a lot like food. And when you cook with love, it makes a difference in the flavor. And I think this was a labor of love. You can see and, and recognize that just in the planning of the event today. So I wanted to acknowledge with all that that word means, Vinu and Forrest for your work tonight. I was born in Cowtown. If you're not familiar with the term, it's Calgary. I've moved here since. Calgary was a wonderful place to be and to grow up and to be educated, but accessibility hasn't been great. It was a much better experience for me um, having accessibility and understanding what that looks like in BC. And not having accessibility has also helped me to understand other people's needs for accessibility better. Each person has a different experience and has different needs, and that experience of my own enables me to advocate better for other people to increase access for all. If people haven't experienced the barriers themselves, they don't always have that lived experience to speak to the issue. Having experienced it yourselves, I'm sure you all have experienced barriers around interpretation provision. Um, you know better how to fight and ask for those things. It's important to listen to each individual's experience. As the saying goes, to walk a mile in someone else's shoes, of course, right? Everybody has a different experience and we have to try to relate. This evening is so important to celebrate one year after the ABCA Accessibility BC Act, or sorry, Accessible BC Act has been passed. And we're celebrating, pardon, I'm just checking my notes here, but we're, it's, sorry, the title of the event tonight is the Appreciation Night. And so there's been so much work that's gone into um, all of this. To support ABCA and to see it become a reality in BC. We wanted to show the appreciation to each of you for your time, your efforts, your work, and without you all, without the people in this room, it could not have come together and happened. So it was really important for us to come together and recognize each and every one of your work. 
just want to acknowledge everyone for their advocacy, for their improvement of accessibility, for their um, involvement. Some people have given 10, 20, 50 years, even one year of your time. Thank you so much. And I want to acknowledge you for your work. We have more work to do. We've had successes. We must continue. And we must continue together. Just as Ricky was saying, um, we continue together as a group, as a community, supporting one another. Each individual effort is recognized, not just the organizations. I hope each of you enjoy the evening. Have a good time, <laughs> and thank you. Are we on? Well, there we are. We had to remove the barriers for the hearing people as well. That mic was giving us some trouble. We had to switch out. Next up, Paula Wesley an Indigenous individual. Could you please come to the front? Hello, good evening, everyone. It's so great to be here. It's so nice to see everyone's actual smiles tonight. It's um, invigorating to be here this evening. Uh, so my welcome to each and every one of you, uh, my thanks to everyone who came. I have been thinking about this evening and I know I was asked to present and oh, I was back and forth with Imran and Reiki and going, oh, I don't know what to say if I get up and uh, present but I will go back to the beginning and why I'm even here. Uh, Forrest had asked me back in January, and he too have a phone call. So we got on FaceTime with each other and he asked if I would be interested in being a part of a committee or on a board and I thought he has got an ulterior motive. He never just asks, how's it going? He uh, wanted me to get into leadership. He recognized the skills that, that I was bringing, and I said, I'll think about it. Um, I really appreciated the call, and I answered him the next day, and I said, yes, I would get involved. And that is why I'm actually here on this stage tonight, is because I said yes to a phone call. My name is Paula Wesley. I am a First Nations individual from up north. I flew down tonight. Uh, the airline was actually quite on time, so I was pretty impressed. Um, I am going to show a slide tonight that uh, shows you where my name came from. I am Paula Wesley of the Simath, which is part of the Salo Nation. My grandmother was born and raised as part of the Salo Nation and now lives in Chilliwack, part of the Skokale First Nation. Her Point family currently lives there. And that is part of my heritage, part of my family on the matriarchal side. And the reason I bring up a point family is that something that my grandmother has always talked about and she has um, given me to understand that it is an important part of an Indigenous person's opening to a presentation to ground themselves. And so it's important for me to say I'm part of the Samath people 
this amassed is a long line of people on the matriarchal side of my family. And on my father's side, we are from the Shincham, which is, um, I'll show you a map on my next slide. <laughs> I know that it will be difficult to see, just to see the word in ASL and not to be able to see what it is uh, written out because it is a longer word and an unfamiliar word for many people. So my father's people are from Terrace, British Columbia, which is up north near Prince Rupert. Only about 10,000 people live up in the area, close to Kitimat, perhaps you would know that. And uh, my mother's people are from Chilliwack. And so for me, there are different nations that I come from and that I hold within myself. And so when Forrest asked me to say, to be on this committee and I said yes, it was because of the Accessible BC Act. I knew that there was going to need some skilled leadership and some Indigenous input. And so as an Indigenous individual who is also deaf and who has been an activist for a long time, I knew that I brought with me that history. I know that many Indigenous people struggle with barriers especially if they are also deaf. And it's not, al it's not always easy to have access. Access is often based in the lower mainland. And so for uh, us in the north, there are different barriers that need to be. It's not just an indigenous issue. It's also an, indig uh, an issue of communication and accessibility in a variety of different ways, particularly as a deaf individual, but somebody who has also lived in the Indigenous communities that I have lived in. Yeah. It's also worth mentioning the diverse amount of people. Someone has already mentioned that the amount of diversity that is in this space. And it's so important for me to also bring that recognition tonight that the communities that we come from also need communication accessibility. They need access. So if I go back, to the Spokale people, the people of the Stalo. And we think about my first experience with the Stalo people. My family is from the Stalo nation, the people of the river on the map. I don't know if you can see it, but there is a small little red dot just outside of Chilliwack where my point family comes from. And that is where there is a struggle for access to communication and access to the internet, access to the outside world, how to use different technologies. There is an access issue in general. Many other communi communities have access, and yet my people, my grandmother's people, are frustrated because there is a lack of access. There is a lack of ability to express that even that frustration to those who could bring help. There is no easy roadmap. And so for me, I felt it was important tonight to stand up here and share that, that there are many people in this province who still do not have a voice and who still are being left unheard. So the Kitsalem First Nation, where my father is from and his family, that point family is from the north. And people in the north have even less accessibility than I have. They do not have in-person interpreting services. They don't even have video remote interpreting because the access to the internet is not there. And so they often depend on people who are outside of the indigenous community who maybe know a little bit of sign language who maybe know a little bit to be able to access that communication. <coughs> there are not many people to provide that service. So there are many deaf and hard of hearing individuals in the North, in the Kitsalem, who are discriminated against on many levels, who have a very difficult time, who have a very full life of struggle and sorrow versus joy and happiness. And so that is why I'm here access, access for those people. 
that protection of the right of deaf and hard of hearing individuals to access communication cannot be left alone. It needs to be advocated for. And so when I think about my sisters and brothers and aunts and uncles who face discrimination and I think about their rights, their rights to access communication, education, to self-esteem, to have a good life. So I think about my role as one to bring that access, to empower them to know how to advocate for themselves, to um, just bring that feeling of self-esteem, of self-importance to my community so they remember. They need a leader to bring them together. And that is what the Accessible BC Act has done for us, has allowed us to work together for a goal for our people, for our future leaders, the children who are being born in our community. When I think about the Accessible BC Act and the work that has been done, I look across the room tonight and I see some faces of people who are thinking, finally, I have seen many of these faces on Zoom and on the screen, and I'm finally seeing people in person, and I can see some faces without masks in person, and it is so wonderful to be here. And I think about the role that GVAD is playing and the role that the PAC is playing. Over this past year, I have learned so much about the challenges. Minister Simon spoke about the rush people are in the time that it's going to take and there have been some speed bumps and those speed bumps always slow your car down and they're slowing the work of the committee down but we are not falling down we are not breaking down we are getting stronger and moving forward together and that I think is the the power of the pack and the power of GVAD that we can look at what has been done already and we're able to look at the examples of the past and not give up if we've just had a bad day. I've had several of those over my lifetime and I'm so thankful I have not given up. I think when we're faced with struggle, it's really important to remember not to give up. A struggle isn't there to stop you, it is there to show you your strength. And for me, it is remembering where my people came from that gives me the strength to continue through the struggles that I am in. So I really do owe the people in my past a lot, and we owe the people in this room much gratitude and much thanks. I appreciate the people of the Deaf Caucus who have supported all the hours and hours of advocacy, the months of writing letters and white papers and talking to government officials, meeting with ministers and all the work that has been done. And then the Accessible BC Act passed and we were all like, what just happened? The chills that I had when I found out that the act was passed and the work that is left to be done. I also want to acknowledge um, the people and the work that has gone into this moment and into the act itself. So again, I want to say my thanks to Forrest Smith and all the people who stood behind Forrest and advocated together. We came together with a common goal and we all have something in common, Forrest's leadership. Without his support, without his leadership, we wouldn't have been the solid solid unified group that we are. So Forrest said right place, right time. And that is so true. We are here at the right place and the right time and we had the right leader. So he found us the connections. And so we thank Forrest for that. I want to acknowledge Forrest the work that you've done in increasing our access to individuals. So to Forrest our gratitude. I do want to add one more thing. I want um, everyone to stand, if you can, um, for uh, who I'm naming off, Lisa Anderson, uh, Joe McLaughlin, who's not here tonight, Ray Key, Brianne Braun. <laughs> I want you all to stand. Your hard work needs to be acknowledged. So 
your hard work has paid off. I know you are humble and would rather not be taking applause right now, but um, you have made this night possible. If there was no Accessibility Act, there would not be an appreciation event. So thank you all so much for the hard work, the sweat, the tears that all went into passing the BC Accessible Act. Thank you so much, H. Cuff. Just taking a moment, making sure our interpreters are all right, keeping up. On to the next speaker, Cameron Epp, GVAD board director. Cameron. Hello, everyone. My name is Cameron Epp. My sign name is done like this. I am one of the deaf youth here in BC, in the deaf community, and I'm very honored to be giving a presentation today. It's a very exciting evening for us all. I am on the GVAD board, and I enjoy supporting the community in any way I can, and I'm amazed at how much progress we've made in the past year. I remember I used to have to ask uh, my parents to make a call on my behalf. Hey, mom, dad, even into my young adulthood, um, can you call my friend and see if I can come on over? Or can you let somebody know I can't come in because I'm sick? I had no independence. But after a group in BC and other groups across Canada worked hard to advocate for Canadian video relay services to be established, I can make a call all on my own. I can be independent and I have access without having to rely on my parents to make those phone calls. In, two In 2009, the swine took the world by storm and there was no information accessible to us. There was no interpretation provided. And we didn't know what was going on. I had to ask my parents, why are people acting so strangely? What's going on? People seem to be quite paranoid. In contrast, in 2019, 2020, when COVID hit, there was information provided. We had people on the screen providing information about what we were to do. We had access to information, finally. And I felt in the loop and caught up to other people. I felt a better part of what was going on in the world. And I felt able to help. Instead of just trying to find out what was going on, I had the information and was able to help others, and I didn't feel alone. With Accessible BC Act, accessibility has improved immensely. But does this mean we can now put our feet up, relax, call it a done deal? No, we certainly have a lot of work left to do. A lot of work. I work as an education assistant in the public school system, and I have seen some things that are surprising. A lot of students come into the school system with little to no language. We work really hard to give them what they need, try to get them caught up, but most of their time is taken up in learning the language instead of learning content. Once they've got enough language under their belt, now they have to play the next catch-up game of catching up on the content as well. It's not right. <laughs> and teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing are spread thin in our public school system. There are 1,300 school-age kids across BC. Are they all, each of them, receiving enough support? No, only a few are. Most are getting very little support and some none at all. There are not enough staff and resources to provide them with the support that they need. We need to spread awareness about deaf culture, sign language, 
and show people that we don't need what we can, we can learn sign, but that should be the first effort is for children to learn how to sign. And if they learn to use speech and listening later on, fantastic, but let's ensure they have that first language in place so that they can communicate with the world, communicate with people, and actually be included. Teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing, I said, are spread quite thin. We have only 65 qualified teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing in all of BC. And even fewer who are fluent in ASL. I read an article from BCTF and it was talking about recruitment and retention of teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing and they said about 70% um, of the teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing who are currently working will be retiring in the next five years. So who's going to be left to support the students throughout the province? We have only one signing focused daycare in all of BC. L and it almost closed last year because of insufficient funding. So kids have even less access to signing programs at that age. If children are our future and we don't have enough teachers and we don't have enough spaces in sign language using care places, how can we expect them to be our future? We need to take better care of them and provide access. I often see EAs working with students, but they are not qualified to work with deaf or hard of hearing students. But they don't have enough people to do the job, and so they'll do the best they can with whoever they can find. I met one EA who was working with a student who requires sign language to communicate, and the EA showed no interest in learning sign language. No one else was available, so they were put in the position, but it increased the interpreter's work. They had to interpret between the student and the teacher, as well as now the student and the EA. It was an immense amount of work. I'm hoping that we can look at the various issues in deaf education and sort out a best approach to solve these issues and provide better accessibility for school, for kids who are deaf or hard of hearing in BC so that they can become more successful. They can be their creative, wonderful selves and they can be even better in the future. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Once again, just taking a pause. <coughs> Next up are our IBPOC, Indigenous, Black, and People of Color committee members. We have two representatives here today, Sharon Lee and Ralph Newberry. If you both would please take the stage. <laughs> Just playing a game of after you, no, after you. Finu is just providing a reminder to please stand on the X on the stage. <laughs> hello, everyone. Oh, I'm so nervous. Okay, hello, everyone. My name is Sharon Lee, and I am South Korean and deaf. I was born and raised in Canada, BC particularly. 
my parents are South Korean as well. And I am on the IBPOC committee to provide healthy relationships in the deaf community and to eliminate racism. Our goal is to work together and collaboratively. And the IBPOC committee also provides access support to IBPOC deaf and hard of hearing community members throughout the province. Our goal is to work collaboratively and to support each other. During the COVID pandemic, I was struggling to communicate with my mother. She's in a, a home and I had to rely on my sister often. We were, of course are dealing with multiple language differences, but I was so happy that finally with the BC Accessibility Act passed, I was able to say, look, there's a law in place. You all need to provide interpreters. We need to have somebody who interprets between ASL and English, but also an English Korean interpreter. And we are looking to make things accessible for not only myself and my mother, but also for everyone throughout the community. Now that the law is passed, hooray, we're one step closer to that goal. I want to thank each and every one of you. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ralph Newberry. I'm from the US, um, but I have been in Canada for a long time. I identify as a person of color who is black and um, have been here in British Columbia for quite some time as an artist. I am well known across the country for my painting and I also work as a peer support worker uh, then that's under the auspices of the well-being program and that's uh, a program that supports the mental health and well-being of individuals here in the province and I would really like to express my appreciation to Forrest Smith for um, creating the IBPOC committee in uh, all of British Columbia under GVAD. So thank you so much for us for recognizing that need and making that happen. Our committee provides accessibility support to IBPOC uh, deaf community members across the province to see better access throughout. And so thanks to all of you for allowing that to happen. I am just going to interrupt us for a moment. Apparently someone has taken a dongle with a key. So if you have done that by accident, please put it out. So if someone has left uh, a key for a Dodge vehicle out at the front. So if um, you are missing a key, that's where you can find it. Next up, representing the deafblind community is Eddie Morton. Eddie, if you will. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eddie Morton. My sign name is like this, and you'll have to excuse me. I am very nervous. Uh, I don't know which way is up. <laughs> uh, 
pretty sure it's raining up there, isn't it? The water is going to burst. <laughs> uh, no, I am nervous standing up in front of you all. The month of June is actually Deafblind Awareness Month, and uh, the government of BC put four seventy. $640,000 towards deafblind accessibility for intervening services over the next two years. And of course, we are hoping that it doesn't stop at two years, but that it become um, an ongoing program. The deafblind community has been faced with a lack of intervening services. And we have been receiving support through CNIB over the past many years, and yet it hasn't been enough. We have been advocating, and we have finally gotten that support through the government. We wrote letters, never heard anything back, felt like we were talking to a brick wall, but we finally see this money coming through. Children who were from birth to grade 12, got funding and yet deafblind adults got nothing. And so while I am happy for the children, there was still advocacy that needed to be done. And then in about 1990, I think, I'm probably forgetting my years, but at that time I was the president for the BC Association of the Deafblind. And I was called to go to the Canadian Deafblind Association's presentation and that um, was for individuals who had had um, deafblind and rubella. Um, and I didn't know what, what that was going to be, and so I thought it needed, um, I, I took the opportunity to then present to government officials what it is like to, as a deafblind individual to be completely cut off from both sight and sound, and how isolating that is, and how you need someone to come and help you to do all the daily activities that people take for granted and how deafblind individuals just like any other member of the community needed that full access to the things and the services and activities in their community and at that presentation that opportunity to share that it felt like the information was given and then a few months later, I was told that I'm so sorry, but there is no funding coming for the deafblind community. And that, of course, made us all want to just give up. I felt like giving up, and yet it, we knew that we needed to continue to advocate. Fast forward to 2005, where we received some money from CNIB. Unfortunately, the funding was really quite sparse for deaf-blind individuals. CNIB has a huge mandate of people to take care of, and yet our committee ended up disbanding. There was no one to be the voice for the deaf-blind community anymore. And of course, that was devastating. But never give up, never surrender. Again, fast forward to 2016. Uh, talking to both Leonor and um, another individual. Uh, they said, get involved with the well-being program. Get involved with the senior citizens. There are deaf-blind seniors who need your help. CNIB is still willing to listen. Uh, Western Institute for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, they hadn't changed their name to Wavefront at that time, started talking about what to do how do we lobby the government? How do we get the right person? And then of course, mid-advocacy COVID hit. Um, Wavefront did pilot a program, but it was just a pilot and it didn't have enough funding and it was unsatisfactory. You only got intervener services three hours a month. Could you imagine only having access to your community for three hours a month? For t and uh, compare that to Ontario, where you get six hours, double the service. And so we thought, well, you know, it's a start, but there is more work to do. And so now the BC government has finally recognized the needs of the BC deafblind community. And I am so grateful. I'm sure the Accessible BC Act had something to do with that. So I think 
the government for their advocacy and action and uh, thank the community here for their action and their advocacy. Thank you so much. Okay, now on to our sponsors for this event tonight. I want to welcome the representative for Convo Canada, Brom Jordan. Checking to make sure the interpreters are all right. Before I start, as Imran stated, I wanted to acknowledge the land that we're on. I'm so grateful that we're able to come together and celebrate and recognize the work that's been done, but I simultaneously want to recognize our history and terrible history in many ways. Um, here in Canada, all that has happened, and so I just want to take the lessons from that moving forward. The famous river here, the traditional name of that river is the Stalo. I only knew the English name of the river for so long, so I appreciate Paulo, Paula earlier signed the sign for Stalo, and so I'm always learning. I appreciate learning that sign today. I also want to say hello to the Honorable Minister Nicholas Simons. Thank you so much, and I appreciate your decision to stay a little longer. There will be delicious cake, as you may have heard. Also thanking Stephanie Keddo, very important person in all the advocacy work that she's done and supported us with over the years. For every single member of the deaf community and all government representatives, thank you for coming tonight. We wanted to celebrate, and of course, we also recognize that there's much work left to be done. We are by no means finished, and we will carry on. I'll talk a little bit about Convo Canada. We are a deaf-owned, deaf-led, signing-centric company. Signing-centric means that all day, every day, we communicate our business in sign language. Convo Canada is a company that represents the lived experience of deaf people. All of the decisions we make are based on that lived experience of various barriers and, barriers and frustrations. We are also users of our own services, meaning we do understand. We have a wonderful team of employees and interpreters who work with us. Every person has contributed their um, creativity and help in the process to make a difference. I'm not sure if you all know where the Convo headquarters is located. Can anybody give me the answer? Ontario? No, no, no. The headquarters is in Burnaby. Local headquarters in Burnaby. We are proud to be located here in Burnaby. We do not only provide video relay interpretation service. We also provide community interpreting services, both in person and virtual, like tonight. Also, ASL English translation services, remote interpreting services. Our business is growing, and if you have any questions about that, please feel free to look at our website. It is a very simple URL to memorize, convo.ca, C-O-N-V-O dot C-A. Seeing all these wonderful speeches has been really inspiring, seeing all the work that's been done over the years. Going to various events, I see the same question asked again and again, whether I'm going to a conference, 
a meeting, a doctor's appointment, typically when I go, people will say, where's your interpreter? Your interpreter. Where's your interpreter when I arrive somewhere? That word your comes up again and again. But I think our solution is to remove the why on that word. Where is our interpreter? If we think about the use of an interpreter, the service is accessible for both people using an interpreter. They're also accessing our language and helping us with what we need. That communication goes both ways. So interpreters here tonight, Nigel's my interpreter. No, these deafblind interpreters working at the front are not my interpreter, they're all our interpreters. And so tonight, I hope that we can all enjoy the celebration, eat some cake, and tomorrow, let's continue to work together to remove that why and look at our. Thank you so much. Thank you for your support, and I believe that we can continue to work together to improve things for everyone and make it inclusive for all. Thank you. Switching interpreters, just a moment. Next, representing DCF, which stands for Deaf Community Foundation of BC, which is also a sponsor of the event, event tonight, Gordon Vitray. Hello, everybody. Hope everybody's doing good. Hope you're all having a good night. It is so wonderful. It can't be stressed enough how great it is to be together. My name is Gordon. You can see that up on the screen. I am the president of the Deaf BC Foundation, the Community Foundation, DCF. We support deaf access across this province and we are so excited to be here tonight. The Deaf Community Foundation, or DCF, came into being in 1999 as part of the funding that was given by the British Columbian government to recognize the harm that was done at the Jericho Hill School for the Deaf. Mm -hmm. There has been a lot of money put towards that foundation um, and it has gathered interest and that money has been used for grants over the years to support community innovation it supports the Okanagan Valley Association of the Deaf, the Greater Vancouver Association of the Deaf. It supports me getting my notes out of my pocket. Just one moment. <laughs> the Jericho Hill Legacy has also created the Happy Hands Club, the Deaf Northwest 4x4 Club, the BC Association of the Deaf, uh, Deaf Blind, Bright Place Women's Center as well. And I would like to honor two individuals. Um, they have both passed unexpectedly last year. Uh, Roby, who passed away. And then a few weeks later, we also lost Allison Anderson. Uh, she was one of the teachers at the school for the deaf, and Roby was the, uh, one of the managers for the Deaf Community Foundation. The two of them from worked tirelessly for many years for the Deaf Community Foundation, and without them, uh, we were on rocky ground. We really needed to have an emergency board meeting, get together, move forward on how we were going to go. Uh, we held our AGM in the fall, where we put out a broad plea to the community for all deaf persons in British Columbia, regardless, 
to come to the meeting. It was an urgent meeting. We had an open forum. I'm sorry, we will be having that in the fall. And so I would like everyone to come. Uh, Nigel Howard, who is working tonight, is also our vice president. I'm going to stand for a moment. And Raki Pillay is also um, a member of our board. Our treasurer is Asadali Bachu. And our northern representative is Ian McAllister. And on the island, we have Tim Lee, Tim Lane, sorry, that was the interpreter. And I would also like to introduce our new program manager, Renu Senga. Where is Renu? Renu's out there in the back. Uh, we're really glad to have her on board. And with this strong board together, we can move forward uh, utilizing the money that we have been gifted in order to create better spaces for our community so that the deaf uh, children and adults in our community will benefit. So things that we can do now is uh, ask Riki actually to come to the front and Imran as well. We are now donating tonight $20,000 to the Greater Vancouver Association of the Deaf from the Deaf Community Foundation in order to continue your hard work, spend it wisely, not all in one place. Um, and like I said, we are going to be able to uh, make more donations. I would like to call Jonathan McDonald to the front. I was looking for him, but he's already up here. Oh my goodness. That was quick, Jonathan. So Jonathan, great to see you in person. And for the BC School for the Deaf, in support of the school for access and equipment, $100,000. I met with Jonathan several weeks ago um, when we talked about getting special desks for the students that are digital, that they can be written on and erased, almost like an Etch-a-Sketch if you're thinking old school. And so those desks cost $1,000 each, which is why we're looking at funding the equipment. And uh, Jonathan is asking if he can say a few words. Thank you, everyone. I will step down and leave the stage to Jonathan. Hello, I am Jonathan McDonald. Some of you I might be a new face, but I am a math, in, math and sciences teacher at BC School for the Deaf. Thank you so much for your support tonight from the Deaf Community Foundation. It makes a massive difference to us, and we are looking forward to bringing that forward, uh, bringing our school up into the 21st century. <laughs> Thank you so much. Fist pumps all around. Ooh. This is forest here, $100,000 to the School for the Deaf. That is incredible. The Deaf Community Foundation and Convo Canada um, have hearts the size of all outdoors. Uh, the generosity is unparalleled. Yes, maybe we would like to have a also small community center with a little bit of coffee and a little bit of tea. We don't do things quietly. We do things with a bang here in the deaf community. So we are at 844 and I did promise us a quick evening. So um, I hope uh, I haven't lost everyone's attention yet. We do have an inspiring lineup still to come just checking in with the interpreters, making sure I haven't left anyone behind. Sorry, just finding my place in my own notes.
course, we're actually live. You know what, this isn't gonna work. I totally thought I could pull this off. Just one moment. All right, we are good to go. We should have full screen now. And Forrest is saying, can you see me okay? We've got somebody up on the screen here. So for those of us in the room, here on the screen is, uh, maybe you could have Josiah, we can move a little bit. Are we better for the interpreter? No, we need you to move back a little. So we're just taking direction from our, I'm not sure how comfortable I am standing super close to people. Is this okay? Uh, as the interpreter, I'm just taking some direction. All right, this is Forrest. I told you I was gonna keep this short. I'm going to introduce to you Frank Folino. Frank Folino is the Canadian Association for the Deaf. Um, both for the ASL and LSQ users across our country. He was the president, oh, Frank, to 2021, 2013 to 2021. So Frank um, may be a familiar face to many of you. He played a key role as a leader at the national level for the uh, Accessible Canada Act, the ACA. He's presented to the House and to the committee and when the, the bill came to the Senate, there was no ASL, LSQ, ISL recognition in that act. And Frank pushed hard and advocated hard. So our gratitude and Frank for the work that he has done at the national level, ensuring that um, sign languages are recognized. So we had not only Frank, but also Lisa and one other individual out there, name is escaping me at the moment, to work hard at the Senate level to get that amendment in the Accessible Canada Act. If it wasn't for that amendment, ASL, LSQ, and ISL, Indigenous Sign Languages, would not have been included perhaps in the BC, the Accessible BC Act. There may have been um, not quite the same clout so our thanks to the work and the advocacy that was done by Frank and others at the national level and the team that Frank led. So Frank, I just wanted to turn the floor over to you for the next couple of minutes. First, I wanted to thank Forrest and your entire team. It's been an honor to be invited tonight to your event. 
I'm so sorry I wasn't able to be there in person with you all to celebrate. I had competing commitments tonight, but I feel that I am with you all in spirit. <coughs> I'm in BC, in Vancouver, in spirit. And I just wanted to start off with a land acknowledgement. I wanted to acknowledge the Indigenous people um, here in the Ottawa area. I am remoting from, and I want to honour the original peoples um, who have um, stewarded the land where we live, eat, work, play, and travel. Thank you to those Indigenous peoples. There have been so many presentations given tonight. The speeches have been incredible. And I think the important thing that we've seen throughout has been that ASL, sign language, is so key for deaf, deafblind, hard of hearing, deafened, deaf disabled people to communicate with. Your language rights, your right to access information, to communicate in the services that you're both receiving um, and taking part in need to be accessible for all deaf, hard of hearing, disabled, deaf, blind, and um, deafened people to be a part of society and to ex access various services, to be a part of the political sphere, to be um, a part of everything. And with the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, this is a fundamental piece that means that deaf people are not going to be left behind, that they can participate. And that motto of nothing about us without us applies. And I want to thank BC for the accessibility caucus, <coughs> for all the people, you all know who you are. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your commitment, for your contribution in fighting to have the language recognition directly in the ABCA. Thank you for your hard work, your contribution, and thank you to the entire community. Every individual, no matter how small or large, made a contribution, and it mattered. It made an impact to create the change for the future generation to have better quality of life and to have better access to communication, to information in their own sign language. So once again, thank you so much, and please do enjoy the rest of your evening. I hope to visit the Vancouver area soon. See you all then. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you so much, Frank. I'm hoping you're going to keep watching the live stream. I am going to uh, turn off my camera now. So thank you so much for your comments just now. Ooh, Frank is an inspiring man. Working with him has been an honor and a privilege. Working with Lisa Anderson has also been incredible. Understanding the Accessible Canada Act and how that parts of it would apply here in British Columbia, how federal law and provincial law work together has been a complex and uh, multifaceted experience. So Sam, <laughs> you are on the hot seat. My dog's name is actually Sam as well. I miss Sam, he's a good dog. Anyway, we have Sam Turcott here with us tonight. Oh, I can catch up on my slides. The accessibility legislation. Um, Sam Turcott is one of the lead staff members. He worked with David, and I cannot remember the minister's name, but Sam led a team of so many incredible individuals. I'm, I'm never going to remember all of their names, and so I'm not even going to try at this point and just say incredible people. But Sam led them with an open mind and an open heart. He didn't beat around the bush and he got involved. He allowed the opportunity for GVAD to connect, answered emails. I don't think I could have done this without him. 
I don't know, Sam, if you came prepared to say a few words, or you just want to say them from your seat, or if you want to get up to the front. Um, this wouldn't have been possible without you, so thank you so much. Uh, Will that be uh, sufficient? Okay. <laughs> Um, Forrest didn't tell me that I would be making remarks tonight, um, but I am truly honored uh, that he's invited me uh, to, to do so. Um, my name is Sam Turcott. I'm the executive lead for accessibility uh, with the Ministry of Social Development uh, and Poverty Reduction for the Government of British Columbia. Previously, I was the executive director for policy and programs uh, with a nonprofit organization uh, in Disability Alliance BC, uh, in Vancouver called Disability Alliance BC. Um, I'm also uh, a legally blind person. Um, and I decided um, some years ago that I was going to uh, devote a very significant portion of my energies in my professional and personal life um, to supporting uh, accessibility uh, for people who need accessibility supports um, in British Columbia. Um, and I, I, I hope that you will allow me a moment of candor uh, in this room. Um, as a legally blind person, um, I have occasionally felt that coming into spaces in the deaf community uh, that I am a traveler in this community and that it is a space where I am um, learning how to interact and communicate and be a good ally and supporter to the community. Um, and I am just so appreciative of the warmth and the welcome that leaders like Forrest, leaders like Vinu, um, and really everyone who I have the pleasure of interacting with um, in this community. The example that you set um, in creating spaces that are inclusive uh, and creating spaces that are, are accessible for all is really an inspiration uh, to me and it's an absolute honor to be with you um, tonight. Um, I am just so uh, excited to be with you shortly after the one year anniversary um, of the passage of the Accessible British Columbia Act into law. Um, and I think that it's so important that we both mark the occasion of this anniversary uh, and also that we recognize the immense amount of work um, that we still need to do um, in supporting the deaf community, uh, supporting the broader community around the province who need uh, uh, of people who need uh, greater access and the reduction of barriers, um, and also uh, in supporting government to continue to work um, with community in accordance with the principle of nothing about us without us, um, to ensure that we are all doing the best that we can um, to create a more acce accessible uh, and inclusive future. Um, for ourselves and for those who will come after us. Um, so thank you for us for the opportunity um, and I'll wish everyone a wonderful rest of the evening. Thank you. And uh, with our thanks, Sam, a book on the history of uh, the School of the Deaf here in BC. Thank you. waiting for the interpreters to switch places. Sorry, I'm being 
directed to move the mic out of the way. One moment. The GVAD Board of Directors from 2019 to 2021, I was the president at that time. I did not make decisions all by myself and run the whole association alone. I had the full support of a board behind me who was committed to access, and so my thanks. There's no time to call them all up to the front this evening, but um, Joel, if you could stand. Joel was our vice president at the time. Jesse, yeah, Jesse stand in the corner was our treasurer. Had Tammy, Tammy was is not able to be here tonight, but Tammy was our secretary. Imran, who you have met already, uh, was on the board and is now moved up to a co-president position. So our congratulations to Imran, Ray Marie who has moved to Saskatchewan and obviously is not with us tonight, but um, was key in many of our discussions and brought wisdom beyond uh, anything I can describe. Um, something about Netflix issues. Ah, I'm sorry, I'm giving Jonathan a hard time. That's an inside joke, but Jonathan, uh, we have had so many late night conversations that interrupted his Netflix binging, I can't even tell you. Mia, who is also not able to come tonight. Um, she's somewhere in the province. Oh, I have just gotten the information that she has now moved over to the island. And then Craig, Craig McLeod, I think his last name is also a deafblind individual, um, a wonderful um, advisor to our board uh, and to previous boards. Um, when Leonor was the president, Craig, we also had Kim Wood, who was the president, um, and then it became me, and then went back to Kim, and Leonore was the president for four years before it came back to me. So Lenore, if you could stand and be recognized as well for the hard work. So the GPAD board has been all volunteers, and it's very difficult. I don't know if you've tried to get volunteers for anything recently, but it has been difficult. And so this new board that is under the leadership of Ray Key and Imran and Jesse, um, they are looking for more people to support them. They need more volunteers to join the board. That is how GVAD will survive. GVAD is 96. We're hitting our senior years, but we want to stay strong. Uh, I mean, I don't know. There's probably some kind of hard rock party we could throw when we turn 100, right? But uh, that's what those centenarians do. I'd also like to say that Elena Finley, um, Elena Finley took on the uh, leadership of the BC Framework for Accessibility Legislation Discussions, which happened in the fall of 2019. So just before COVID, there was, um, we had just established a deaf hub and uh, we were able to, um, I think I reached out at the time to ask for information to be posted on the website. That got posted and then Elena got up there. Elena is uh, with her brother tonight, so can't be with us, not here. is not here. But her brother is here, so she, he can pass that on to her. Our thanks for the work that Elena has done as the facilitator for the BC Framework for uh, Accessibility. Also the BC Deaf Accessibility Working Group and Caucus members. Deaf and hard of hearing, hearing members, people from across the province who came together to ensure that as the Accessible BC Act was being worked on, that the issues that were paramount for the deaf community were being listened to. They uh, listened to their local communities and brought it together in a group. Of course, we don't have time to have everyone stand up, but the uh, BC Deaf Accessibility Working Group team members uh, Paula mentioned some of them already in her speech, but Paula Wesley, I'll have you stand. Renu Senga. Raki Pele. Lisa Anderson. Lisa Anderson. 
uh, was mentioned I with in Frank's speech, working on the Canadian Accessibility Act, so Accessible Canada Act, the ACA. Yeah. So there's double thanks there for Lisa. Paula is also working on that, representing Indigenous Sign Language. I also want to recognize the work of Dr. Joseph McLaughlin, who not able to be here tonight, but um, he um, has so much wisdom and learning. I, wor I learned so much from him. Brianne Braun, whose daughter is now seven, I think. Uh, Brianne is here. Thank you so much. Working with you from the pr perspective of a parent has been incredible. So thank you so much, Brianne. Um, there are over 50 people from the Deaf Accessibility Caucus who have come and gone over time. Um, I cannot name them all. The list is up here on the screen. There's more that I probably didn't get on there. But for Frank, Jody, Cecilia, Sukhvir, Ralph, Tammy, Kareem, all of the people on that screen, thank you so much. Eddie, I will give you a copy of this presentation that you can read at your leisure so you don't miss any of this information. Uh, and Eddie's just saying, please do not send it as a PDF, send it as a Word document, otherwise my uh, screen reader won't be able to read it for me. Word document, gotcha. All right. I want to touch on this um, idea of a deaf ally. What is an ally? You usually think about that in wartime, when you hear somebody is an ally to somebody else. but we think about our allies in the fight for accessibility. A 13-year MLA, somebody who approaches everything with curiosity, thought about the Provincial Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services, the dorm at Victory Hill, the Ministry of Children and Family, something, I always forget the names of all the different ministries but somebody who has worked hard, who has listened to the issues in the community, who has the heart of an ally, Stephanie Cadu. What it means to be an ally in the deaf community, supporting the goals of the deaf community and showing that support, promoting equality for deaf people, to advocate to work together in advocacy. That has been my experience with Ms. Kadu over the years. I'm just gonna call her to the stage if she's willing to come up. fangirl moment. I've never actually met him in person. Hi, Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Minister, for the lift. Um, the Minister and I have worked together in a number of capacities over the years, and so I know he'll take this, uh, take this uh, for what it's meant for, but um, I, I noticed when he was up here and he had his speech and he carefully was reading through all the pages and careful not to miss anything, and he even read the word conclusion um, ahead of his concluding remarks. Because you don't know this unless you've worked for the, fe or the provincial or federal government, but when you're a minister of the crown and your staff prepare speaking notes for you for an event, they, tell they list all sorts of things they want you to say, most of which is boring. But on the front page it says, check against delivery. And that's for the staff who are supposed to listen to every word the minister says and make sure it matches the speech. And if it doesn't, run away quickly and solve all the problems that the minister just created. But I think that Nick didn't create any tonight. I did think a little bit when you were up here, you were sweating, Nick, and you were shaking a little bit, that um, 
that it was a bit like a British sitcom. <laughs> it was a bit of yes minister. <laughs> and um, as you as you spoke, um, I was thinking it's really nice to be here with some old friends and some new ones. Um, and I will take just a second to recognize a couple of people that are in the room that I, I one that's with me, Councillor Linda Annis from the City of Surrey, and Anita Huberman, who I've worked with uh, as, a, as a champion in Surrey from the Board of Trade, uh, who is here as well celebrating with us tonight. Um, I've spent uh, a lot of time with a lot of people in this room in different capacities, Forrest um, and others. But some of you don't know me at all, and so I'll just give you a little bit of history. Um, I spent most of my adult life after my spinal cord injury advocating for people with disabilities in one way or another. Um, I was a staff member with Spinal Cord Injury BC where I ran uh, their peer support program. I was a board member at Disability Alliance uh, where Sam uh, eventually became the executive director. Uh, I was president of a theater company called Real Wheels um, that focuses on real roles for people with disabilities. Um, I was a cabinet minister and uh, served as an MLA for almost 14 years. I was on advisory committees around diversity and inclusion for global television in the city of Vancouver. And in all those roles, I did lots of different things. Um, I started a peer support program, as I said. I developed an accessible tourism strategy for the province in advance of the 2010 Olympics. Um, I advanced reforms to income and disability assistance as the minister. I established the minister's council on employment and inclusion, which today operates as the president's council uh, under Nick's uh, ministry. Sorry, Minister Simon's ministry. Old habits die hard. Um, and, and I pushed the government as a member of opposition. Well, formerly as a minister pushing my own government, and then as a minister, uh, an opposition member pushing my government specifically around housing and the need for accessible housing to be in the building code um, and the need for further work on employment for people with disabilities. And I pushed the minister further uh, when it came to the Accessible BC Act, which I will note, as with the federal legislation, received all party support. This is not a political issue. All politicians understand that this is the right thing to do. The problem is politicians don't know how to do it. So when the federal government passed the Accessible Canada Act in 2019, um, it created the Accessibility Standards Canada organization, which Dr. Joe McLaughlin is now uh, on the board of. Uh, it, com it created the commissioner at the Human Rights Commission, uh, who was just appointed. Uh, Goat Heil, Goat Heil. I'm still working on his name. He's a very nice man. Um, and the role of Chief Accessibility Officer. Um, there are a number of priorities under the Accessible Canada Act which are very similar uh, and mimicked uh, by the Accessible BC Act. Areas where we need to break down barriers. And of course, for the Accessible Canada Act, that means within federal jurisdiction. Um, that's employment, the built environment, communication and transportation, amongst others. So now as the Chief Accessibility Officer, also created under that Act, I'm an independent special advisor to the minister responsible for the Act, Minister Qualtro. And uh, I have no illusions about the challenges ahead. People with disabilities, myself included, have felt disenfranchised by the policies that governments, businesses, and our communities make because we haven't been concluded from the start. They haven't been developed with a lens on accessibility. Despite all of the talk about inclusion and the importance of inclusion and the understanding of how inclusive we should be as a society, the policies, the programs still don't hit the mark. Governments, private sector organizations, politicians, and community members have espoused the values of this for years. But when that lens isn't used, things get missed. Worse yet, people decide that in this instance, it's not necessary. 
so it doesn't happen. Unconscious bias is very real. We all carry it. And when it gets in the way, we continue to make mistakes over and over again. So moving the dial on these problems, even now with legislation in place both federally and provincially, there's a lot of work to do. And I come to this position now with the federal government as the first ever chief accessibility officer for our country with a deep understanding of that complexity, both a as a policy maker, as a community member who wants it all to have been done 50 years ago. But I also understand the perseverance needed to bring about systemic change. I have had success doing that. And I will have success doing that at the federal level. But it won't be by myself. I want to be there and need to be there working with partners. And those partners come from the disability community. They come from within government. They come as members of the public service who both care about these issues as allies, who have a responsibility through their role, and who are members of the public service who have disabilities. But it also comes from you. It comes from the community, from the advocacy organizations, from the volunteers. Our doors are open. We need to hear from you. And I need to hear from you where the barriers continue to be. I need to know what the priorities for this community are in moving forward. Can you hear me loud enough? There's lots of work to do and I'm really excited um, to be able to do it with you and for you. And when the minister said nothing about us without us, he's right. Minister Paul Crawford has changed our language to nothing without us. We're citizens. We are equal. And our services need to, re need to reflect that. So congratulations, Sam, and your team. Lots of work to do, and you have partner in me. And Minister, you were right that that committee is going to be important. It's important for the community to share their thoughts and be supportive with the members of that committee. Yeah. But I'm also going to add one caution. Yeah. Sometimes those committee members will feel overwhelmed. Sometimes, as a part of that committee, there will be trade-offs. Sometimes, as a part of that committee, they will make choices. Support them. Tell them when you think they're going in the wrong direction, mm -hmm. but don't make it personal. Politics gets too personal, and good people leave, and good people don't run. Mm -hmm. But there are so many of you mm -hmm. who have something more to give, and this community really mm -hmm. needs to put somebody from the deaf community into mm -hmm. office. I don't care which party, I don't care which level of government. But having a seat at the table does bring change. Mm -hmm. I believe I am evidence of that. I believe that Nick would agree with that. Minister Qualtrough is evidence of that. Mm -hmm. But we don't yet, at least not to my knowledge, have a member of the deaf community representing in our systems. And real public change will take a leader. So I'm leaving you with that, um, because now that I'm not a politician, I can say whatever I want to. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been really nice. And Forrest, I'm sorry I took too long. Um, but thank you for having me here tonight. And Minister, please make sure you buy a lot more copies of the book. Thank you so much. Chris Bob, awesome. Thank you so much.
just uh, switching interpreters, forests. I think we're good. Just checking with everybody. You let me know if you need me to stop or change. Sorry, I was blocking the interpreters. Seen the movie Coda? Hands up if you have. Only half of you? If you haven't seen the movie, you should watch the movie, Minister Simons. That should be your late night viewing. Good movie. Good movie, Coda. So, <laughs> inspiring story. I have children myself. Sorry, just one moment. Uh, so, CODA means child of a deaf adult. If we think about COVID, when COVID first hit, everything was being done in spoken language. Which is just like this. So you see a representation, representation of language happening and you would have no idea through COVID, what was going on. I had a million emails and people just reaching out and I got up at three in the morning for work, but at nine o'clock at night, I was writing letters and I wasn't saying, oh, you know, okay, fine, I'll do it. I was so invested. My son, who was in grade 12, I don't ever want to rely on my children for making phone calls, etc., I got my son up <laughs> and said, please help me write this letter. And he was able to get it done in just a few minutes and we were able to reach the masses. And the next thing you know, we had an interpreter standing on stage on camera providing interpreted, interpreted access to the public. This is just an excerpt from a letter saying the deaf community is ill-informed and misinformed about the pandemic. Without accurate information, the deaf are unable to make informed choices about how to protect themselves, their families, and their communities. We are requesting that you immediately provide a qualified sign language interpreter at daily briefings to help this underserved segment of the population. In addition, the media must be advised the interpreter alongside the speaker in the frame so that the people at home can stay informed. That letter was sent on March 11th of 2020. Just waiting for the interpreters working with our deafblind folks to catch up. I got a lot of things couldn't uh, take all the kudos, had to pass those off to my son. I didn't want to take advantage of him. So Declan is here tonight, and I just want to publicly thank him for his work. He's giving me the thumbs up from the back there. Oh, people don't know who you are, Declan. Stand up. I also want to um, acknowledge our good listeners. When we were going through the pandemic, one of the things that we wrestled with was medical interpreting services. Karen Malley, as the executive director at Provincial Language Services, um, listened, listened to how services could be improved, came to meetings. I met with Karen many times. 
uh, met with a team, with Joe, uh, with Dr. McLaughlin, with um, others, with Anderson, just so many others. Kieran listened. We said there needed to be a new position within the Provincial Health Authority to be the mediator between the deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing community and the medical staff, there needed to be an intermediary. And Kieran was able to listen to that, and a new position was created. Scott Jeffrey, who is behind the camera today, uh, was able to step into that position. A good listener, someone who focuses completely on what another person is saying and engages their ideas in a thoughtful, comprehensive way. A great example is Kieran Mackey. We need more people like her to listen to the community. Unfortunately, she was unable to make it tonight. She's not feeling well. Um, but uh, if you could pass on our thanks to Kieran for being such a great listener Hopefully, uh, the position that Scott is in will expand and we'll see more deaf people in the healthcare system advocating for the rights of communication access. So Karen Malley, Director at PHSA's Provincial Language Services. Another note of thanks is to Donna. Hi, Donna. <laughs> no. And hello to Peggy. Donna, if you would stand, if you can. How many years were you on the board? 25 years. Donna served as a volunteer for our community, keeping GVAD moving forward. So our thanks, and it didn't just take Donna. There was also Peggy. Peggy, if you could take a stand. Peggy, you did such amazing work. 63 years on the board of directors. One of the hardest women I ever met. I like her. She could lead with the ferocity of a bulldog. Peggy is amazing. 63 years of service to GVAD. I am never going to make it that long. 1995, 1955, sorry, to 2018. And there has just been public recognition. And so here's our opportunity to acknowledge you, Peggy, in public for the work that you've done. And you also, Donna. You two are amazing. Working with you two has been an inspiration. Thank you both. Thank you for keeping our community going and strong. V, 63 years. You are an amazing woman. I can't honestly believe we spoke about two weeks ago and she said, oh, it's gonna be 63 years. And I said, no, I'm gonna need your ID to prove and yes, sure enough, Peggy's birthday today, 88 years, double the cake. And I'm going to ask John Warren to take the last few minutes right before cake to uh, share a little bit. So hold on to your horses. I know you, we always say that, hold on to your horses, but in, in ASL we say, hold on to your pants. Nobody all the table at once. We got one more person. John, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, with Ricky and Inspiration, we wanted to, we actually had a celebration with, uh, with, uh, with Leonor's permission. I'm hoping that and get copies of the book. So Lee had written a book of the history of GP, the 100 year history. And he's asking if she will be the one to write the book um, as Joanne wrote the other book saying, with help, she will be willing to write the book. She will thank you to the interpreters who needed some clarification. 
checking in with the other interpreters on the team. So uh, just a short bio actually around Fluke. I'm going to give a little bit of background on who he is. He was actually born in the Netherlands in 1952. His family then moved to Powell River. It's a small town with lots of um, mill smells. He had meningitis, lost his hearing. In 1956, he attended the Jericho Hill School for the Deaf. In 1962, he graduated from there, went off to Gallaudet University, but at the time it was Gallaudet College, studied, had a bachelor's degree in 1966, was awarded, and then met the love of his life, who is sitting right next to him, um, Lenore. They married in 1967. And in 1968, pardon, in 1970, they moved here. I was a teacher for three years. I was 10 years old myself at the time. I remember he was one of my instructors and taught me chess, how to play chess. And studied at FPU, was awarded a master's degree in 1972. 1973, moved to MSSD, right near Gallaudet University, taught there in 1980, decided to move back to BC, decided that his teaching career needed to change and became a lawyer thereafter. So he studied law at UBC, 1986, um, initiated bar, but uh, he is the first, not the first rather, but the third person uh, known across Canada as a deaf lawyer. The first one was in 1903, but he is the third. He worked as a lawyer for many, many years, and in 2011, Retired. How is retirement life for you, Henry? He just gave a quiet nod. He's a very um, man of few words. Just nodded his head. So various people submitted to Forrest some comments that we have put together on PowerPoint for you all to read. We'll go through them very briefly as well. First one is from Jim Root. He's the executive director of Canadian Association from the Dead uh, until the year 2022, starting in 1986. So Henry was the one who truly understood the ability to use the law to demand deaf people's rights and to demand that society respect deaf people's rights. Every deaf person in Canada, in the community, since 1986, everything that we have achieved has been because of Henry's example. The requirement to provide closed captioning was Henry's doing. Sign language rights, Henry's doing. Access to university, once again, Henry. Access to communication technology, like relay services. Henry, again, to thank. Our right to interpreting services in government meetings. Henry, again. In my opinion, Henry Vlug is the single most important deaf Canadian in our history. I am very proud to say that I've had the pleasure of working with him. Congratulations. So Henry, Henry did one thing, then the other, then the other. Who else is there? There's just Henry. Without Henry, thinking about where we would be today, the advocacy that we would have achieved, I can't even imagine where we would be. So thank you so much, Henry. The next remarks, oh yeah, my hand is a little sore. I'm gonna to try to spell clearly. 
Kevin Smith, former president of GBAD 1980 to 1982, has some remarks as well. Pardon the interpreter, Kelvin Smith. It reads, my wife Susie and I would like to compliment so many of you and others who have been involved in making it possible for the passing of the Accessible BC Act into law in British Columbia. You broke many deaf, deaf-blind, and hard-of-hearing accessibility barriers. Just making sure our deaf-blind interpreters have also caught up. Okay. Henry's work and support has never ceased and he has never tired. He has advocated so strongly for the deaf and hard of hearing community. Thank you. Our next comments are from the previous executive director of WIDHH, also a pre past president of the Canadian Hard of Hearing Association, Marilyn Dolly, or sorry, Dolly. I have great respect for Henry's contributions and work. I recall the years we worked cooperatively when Henry was president of the Canadian Association of the Deaf and I was president of the Canadian Hard of Hearing Association. And we advocated for accessibility on many issues, notably with interventions on telecommunications issues and the drive to achieve increased closed captioning of television. Henry is formidable. He works and never ceases. His advocacy continues and he never gives up. Pardon, spelling of one more time, formidable for the deafblind interpreters and for the DIs as well here on stage. Formidable. <laughs> Incredible amount of work and endurance. He never gives up. Well, Henry, let's ask, let's ask him, will you give up? He said, I'll give up a try. How about that? Charles Laszlo, a founding member and former president of the Canadian Hard of Hearing Association. He sent his remarks. Well, as you probably know, Henry is not a patient person when it comes to issues that are close to his heart. He approached our accessibility problems with knowledge of our needs, experience with the problems, and fierce determination to succeed in bringing about changes. Working with him taught me that such determination is often necessary to convince officialdom and decision makers that changes are necessary and possible. Again, to summarize, Charles said, for me, it is a wonderful time looking back on all the work we did together. And one of the deafblind interpreters are saying, pardon me, we didn't quite finish, so we just mi missed the beginning of your next comment. Pardon me. John is apologizing. All right, let me start again. So Charles said that for me, it was wonderful working with Henry. Henry is an incredibly valued, professional colleague. He's an understanding and collaborative person who never tired. He is a great personal friend. And now, highlights of Henry Vlug's accomplishments. These include Ministry of Attorney General, pardon the interpreter, we'll just pause for some of the other interpreters to complete. Law Society of British Columbia, Lawyers with Disabilities, Identifying Barriers to Equality in 2000, 
Vlug and Canada Human Rights Commission v. Canada Broadcasting Corporation, year 2000. Eldridge, 1997, Medical Interpreting Case, Supreme Court of Canada. And Howard v. the University of British Columbia, 1993. Interpreters are still catching up. Thank you, I'm antsy to jump ahead, but you, that's a great reminder. Thank you, I'll slow down and wait. So Henry has made so many valuable contributions to the community. He worked as a criminal, a family, and an estate lawyer. He also acted as a special ombudsperson for the Office of the Attorney General during the Jericho Hill School investigation. He provided guidance and explanations for the people working in that case. This was the first accomplishment, the province of British Columbia Ministry of Attorney General. Now that second one I mentioned, Law Society of British Columbia, Lawyers with Disabilities. This was a group who worked to identify barriers and looked at how those barriers could be removed to provide equality. It was a research group. Thank you for your work there, Henry. The third, Vlug and Canada Human Rights Commission versus Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This was a personal case he brought forward. A complaint about Closed captioning at the time was not deemed necessary by CBC and was removed. And so he fought the case and won. And thanks to all of his hard work, we can all enjoy closed captioning on the broadcasted TV today. Henry was also a support lawyer. Uh, he provided legal familiarity around deaf rights, around deaf access issues and provided that help um, with our lawyer, Lindsay, during um, the Robin Eldridge case. Um, Robin has since passed. Also, Linda uh, Schulte and um, John Warren. The three of us, myself is John Warren, the three of us um, were to working together on a case. His explanation was extremely beneficial, and in the end, we lead, we won the case thanks to Henry's expertise. Okay. Based on that case, MIS Medical Interpreting Services was established and BC then set precedent across the nation where other provinces were able to follow suit. Thank you again for your work. The last one is Howard v. the University of British Columbia. You can see that we have Nigel Howard sitting here in the front interpreting. He went to the University of British Columbia as a student, but interpreters were not provided. The university deemed them as an unnecessary expense and did not want to take that on. Henry got involved and a complaint against the university was lodged and was successful. Now the University of British Columbia was uh, not only ordered to provide interpreting services to all deaf students, but also awarded Nigel Howard a monetary compensation for uh, pain and suffering. And that has had long reaching effects as well in the fact that all interpreters, all uh, post-secondary institutions in the province provide interpreting services to this day. I have one more thing. <laughs> It's a bit of a roast, honestly. Henry, I don't know if you'll agree, walked like this. Had a devil may care kind of attitude and would always walk in and say, yes, you should complain about that. And yes, you have a right to complain about the other thing. So Henry, thank you for all your hard work, for all the advocacy that you have done.
Henry, it's now Forrest. If you could stand for those who don't know Henry, who are unfamiliar with this giant in our community. Henry Vlug, everybody, thank you so much. And Henry is responding with a gracious thank you. And John is saying, come on, you guys, a standing ovation that lasts minutes and minutes is in order here. And just to add, this is John now, just to add everybody. I just want to add one more thing. Just need Henry's eyes up here. Henry. Henry wouldn't be anywhere without Leonore. A good wife backing him up on all of his work. So thank you both, Henry and Leonore. And this is Forrest, the members uh, of the pack who are here. So Rob, you are also here with us tonight. Just wanted to say thank you so much for the work that you do on the Accessibility Committee. Uh, so thank you so much for the representation that you bring and for coming tonight. For everyone who came, I wanted to once again say thank you to Convo Canada and the Deaf Community Foundation for your support and for the community for all that you do. I'll turn things over to Vinu unless it's time for cake. Vinu tells me it's time for cake. So everyone, don't rush over to the table, but I'm going to tell you the cake's not going to be there forever. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your evening. The credits are rolling. The lights are going dark. Have a good night.